Welcome to the Delaware OBGYN Resident Lecture Series. This is a series of short lectures for our residents here at Christiana Hospital in Newark, Delaware. In the previous video, we reviewed how to optimally date a pregnancy and what should be considered a suboptimally dated pregnancy. The reason dating has received so much attention is primarily related to the recent move to eliminate elective deliveries before 39 weeks. That task can be divided into eliminating elective deliveries that are done intentionally before 39 weeks and also doing our best to eliminate elective deliveries done accidentally before 39 weeks. Accidental because we don't have an accurate assessment of gestational age. That's what the last video, the one about Committee Opinion 611, was all about. That video basically said our goal is to optimally date the pregnancy and as a result we won't accidentally deliver anyone electively before 39 weeks. Step 1, get the clinical data about the last menstrual period and determine whether it's useful. If it's not, toss it out and get an ultrasound before 22 weeks. If the LMP info is useful, get an ultrasound before 22 weeks and see if it confirms or reassigns the EDC. Either way, you need an ultrasound before 22 weeks to be considered optimal dating. If you have any questions, go back to the previous video about estimating the due date. All right, so what's today's video about? What's Committee Opinion 688 from March 2017 all about? Well, despite the fact that we've come up with criteria for optimally dating a pregnancy, some patients are not going to be considered optimally dated. Those patients are considered suboptimally dated. Other terms such as lousy dates or much worse are frowned upon. The worst you can be is suboptimal. Hey, everybody gets a trophy. This committee opinion discusses situations where suboptimal dating can be a real issue and what to do in those situations. The process for coming up with a best obstetrical estimate is the same in every trimester. See if the clinical data about last menstrual period is useful and get an ultrasound and see if it confirms or reassigns the EDC. The difference between doing this after 22 weeks as opposed to before 22 weeks is that ultrasound accuracy is so bad, plus or minus two to three weeks, in the second half of pregnancy that we have to say she is suboptimally dated. The first situation discussed is that of elective delivery because again that's the main thing we're trying to prevent. The committee is clear on this. There is no role for elective induction in the suboptimally dated pregnancy. Wait, what, what is an elective delivery? One where there is no clear medical reason either on behalf of the mother or the fetus to deliver before 39 weeks. Examples from previous ACOG publications include uncomfortable patient, patient wants a certain birth date, cesarean on demand, patient lives far away, and things like that. At 41 weeks, late term induction becomes indicated and no longer elective. So if the patient is suboptimally dated, no elective induction at 39 weeks or 40 weeks. At 41 weeks, it is no longer elective. What about a previous low transverse cesarean section? Although there is no reason to go before 39 weeks, which makes it sound elective, a repeat cesarean section, or TOLAC, trial of labor after cesarean, induction should be scheduled at 39 weeks, not before and not after. Next, how about some examples of management that is dependent on the gestational age? Like giving antenatal steroids at 24 weeks, or like giving antenatal steroids at 35 weeks, but not at 38 weeks, or delivery of a patient with preeclampsia at 37 weeks, or one with severe features at 34 weeks, or preterm rupture of membranes at 34 weeks. In all of these cases, use the best obstetrical estimate based on the guidelines from Committee Opinion 611. It may not be truly accurate, but it's the best we can do and it's the default that is the foundation for the management of the patient. 
where can this plan go wrong most? Well, if she's three weeks further than we are saying, we could be letting her go until 44 weeks and allowing the morbidity of a post-term pregnancy, or we can be overdiagnosing IUGR and causing unnecessary induction and testing. If she's three weeks less than we are saying, we could be underestimating IUGR and allow the morbidity associated with that diagnosis. How do we keep from missing IUGR? The committee opinion says, quote, consider an interval ultrasonographic assessment of fetal weight and gestational age, end quote, in three to four weeks. It doesn't say how to interpret that, so I'll put in my two cents. First of all, the ultrasound done at 30 weeks will have the fetus at the 50th percentile. That's how it works. When the third trimester ultrasound report says she is at 30 weeks, it is saying that this estimated fetal weight is the 50th percentile for 30 weeks. Four weeks later, if there is a consistent rate of growth, the fetus will be near the 50th percentile again. Fetuses with IUGR can have different growth trajectories but do not demonstrate consistently good growth. So if the fetus goes from the 50th percentile to the 5th percentile, think of placental insufficiency and step up the surveillance. Okay, so you may be thinking, the 50th to the 5th, how about a less obvious example? Well, I don't know the answer, but 50th to 40th is probably within the variability of fetal growth patterns and within the variability of ultrasound measurements, but 50 to 30th would probably make me want to follow her because I suspect placental insufficiency. However, keep in mind, I just made that up. How about the post-term issue? I'll keep it short. Using the best obstetrical estimate, deliver at 41 weeks and start the late-term surveillance, you know, for example, semi-weekly biophysical profiles, at 39 weeks. Is there any role for amniocentesis for lung maturity? That used to be pretty common, as in, I don't know how far along she is, but if the lungs are mature, I know I can safely deliver. The fact is that early-term and late preterm fetuses with mature lung profiles have more morbidity than those at 39 weeks. The fact that amnio doesn't provide enough reassurance to be useful most of the time, it doesn't have much role anymore. So, figure out if she has a medical indication. If not, just manage as suboptimally dated pregnancy. To summarize, if there is an ultrasound before 22 weeks, she is optimally dated. If it is after 22 weeks, she has suboptimal dating, and suboptimal dating should make it to her problem list. So, one, determine the best obstetrical estimate and use that for most gestational age-related situations. Two, get an interval ultrasound three to four weeks later and decide whether you suspect IUGR. Remember, a patient who presents for an initial visit in the third trimester for prenatal care is probably not less likely to have a risk factor for IUGR. Three, with a previous low transverse cesarean section, schedule the repeat C-section or trial of labor after cesarean at 39 weeks. Four, otherwise, start late-term testing at 39 weeks and deliver at 41 weeks.